Yeah. Looks like we really get to do some observing tonight. Excited. Did you bring the big one? Yeah. Wow. Yes. You, don't, you don't give up easily. And I'm in no hurry. Oh, people ask me that so often. <laughs> I say two to three years. Oh, really? And I put my cross fingers behind my back. So hopefully. Yeah, I'm a third year right now. Okay. Hopefully soon. No <laughs> I know that part. All right, just a couple of quick things. Um, I was contacted by uh, actually the, the lady that's going to be doing our presentation next month, Geraldine Ramirez from the Wichita Club. Um, but we had a few people call and I've had a few emails asking about the library telescope program um, and if that might be something that the club would be interested in. So. She's on the Library Telescope Task Force, so she's going to come and do our presentation next month. But while we were talking about that, um, the Wichita Club participates in uh, the Symphony in the Flint Hills. Oh, yeah. If you've heard about that. Oh, um, yeah. For many years. Yep. Never been out there, though, have you? I have not, but I guess I'm going to be out there this year. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know. She helps us out, I help her out. Um, so if anybody's interested in, in doing that, it's pretty much an all day commitment uh, because the load in time, if we're bringing gear and everything, is from 10 to 11 in the morning and you can't go back and get your car till all the people have gone, which is about 11 o'clock at night. So it's pretty much an all day commitment. Um, you know. If you want to bring a telescope, that's fine too. If you're interested, just let me know. I think she said the deadline was still like a week away to get people's names in. But, uh, you know, just shoot me an email or something if you're interested. When did you say that is? It is June the 11th, Saturday. <clears throat> and it's, uh, if you know, it's out in the middle of a place called Irma's Pasture. Uh, the nearest town would be Bazaar. Uh, the nearest decent sized town would be Cottonwood Falls. Strong so, City. Strong City, yeah. Uh, either way. Neither of which are very big. Yeah, well, you know, they, they have it out in the middle of nowhere for a reason. Uh, but uh, it's, uh, you know, they have some programs during the day and observing at night. Uh, everybody that's volunteering out there has to have some kind of assigned duty. So if you are interested, let me know. And I can show you how to fill out the application and what to put on the application so that they know that you're there with the stargazing group. But then you get to listen to the, the uh, musical it, performance for free, I guess? Yes, that's correct. That's, that's good. Um, so you, you can listen to the concert. Um, and they have food out there. It's not free. They have a food tent. And you can purchase food or bring your own food. But anyhow, um, just let me know if you're interested in that. So tonight, um, we've got one of our uh, physics and astronomy grad students working on his PhD in astrophysics, uh, Alex Polanski. Alex is also the... Um, grad student who, along with Jennifer, um, has kind of organized these uh, telescope nights at KU. So, which is awesome. Yes, um, which are great. But uh, Alex has, um, you know, agreed to give us a presentation tonight. 
on the star planet connection, talking a little bit about exoplanets and what we can maybe learn about the stars that, that they orbit uh, from what we know about the exoplanets. So I'm going to turn it over to Alex. And then it uh, looks like we're going to have a clear night tonight. So we'll be doing some observing after the presentation. All right, thank you so much, Rick. Uh, sure. Is there any way to get the lights killed oh, just a yeah, little bit? Is that seem good for everybody? Awesome, thank you. And if, uh, if I'm not talking loud enough, just let me know, and that's kind of gets in the way sometimes. So. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Rick said, my name is Alex Blansky. I am a third year graduate student at the University of Kansas. And I just want to thank the Astronomy Associates of Lawrence for inviting me to come out here to talk a little bit about what I do. And uh, what I do is work on exoplanets. So I know that there might be a few people who might not know what an exoplanet is. Uh, so an exoplanet, just quite simply, is any planet that orbits a star other than our own sun. And so throughout this talk, we'll go over how we find exoplanets, uh, what the current exoplanet landscape kind of looks like. And uh, finally, I'll tell you a little bit about how I'm trying to understand more about these planets. Uh, by studying closer the stars that they orbit. So astronomy is, I'm sure you all know, is one of the oldest sciences, uh, but the field of exoplanets is actually relatively new. Uh, with the first solid discovery of an exoplanet in the early 1990s, uh, this field really isn't much older than I am. And uh, it was that first discovery, a planet named 51 Peg B, uh, that changed the game. Um, before that, a lot of astronomers sort of had their doubts if we would be able to discover such tiny objects so far away. But with 51 Peg B, the floodgates were open. So now, 30 years later, astronomers have discovered over 4,000 other exoplanets, uh, with more coming out every day. Uh, because of this, we now suspect that on average, every star in the Milky Way should have at least one planet. And most of the over 4,000 exoplanets that we know about have uh, been discovered in just the last five to six years. And uh, this is thanks in large part to Kepler, the first spacecraft that was dedicated to uh, search for exoplanets. So Kepler was so successful uh, because it was searching for what we know as transiting exoplanets. So sometimes by just sheer chance geometry, uh, an exoplanet, the star that orbits and Earth, will align in such a way that the planet will actually pass between Earth and the star, causing the star to sort of dim and brighten ever so slightly. And because we're primarily concerned with how the brightness changes, uh, this actually makes it a very powerful tool, since you can just take a relatively small telescope. I say small, but you know, from our standards, that's pretty big. Uh, but for NASA, this was a pretty uh, modest mission. Uh, we can just take Kepler and stare at a single patch of the sky for months, and uh, just wait for a few of the stars to periodically dim and brighten. So planets are incredibly small compared to their star. So this dimming uh, could amount to only just like less than a tenth of 1% of the total star's brightness, uh, which makes this incredibly hard to see. Uh, so seeing a transiting exoplanet is sort of like seeing a fly walk across stadium floodlights. And actually, this little video right here is real Kepler data. And uh, I cropped it just so that during this movie, there's actually a planet transiting across that star. So just by your own eye, you can't actually detect the transit. But uh, using you know, clever software and uh, data reduction, uh, we can. And uh, what we get, if we look at the change in brightness through time, we can create what's called a light curve. And so the shape of uh, this light curve holds a wealth of information about that planet. How deep the light curve is tells you the size. A uh, bigger planet will create a bigger dip. Uh, if you measure the time between transit events, you can figure out the orbital period of the planet or how long a year lasts on that world. And uh, you can even figure out how far away the planet is from its star, just from this uh, light curve. So, Kepler was so successful in finding transiting exoplanets that another mission uh, was launched to do the exact same thing, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. And TESS has now found nearly 200 more other worlds. And uh, personally, I can tell you that many, many more are on the way. So 
with all these exoplanets being found, um, what is the exoplanet landscape sort of like today? Uh, well, one of the most amazing discoveries to come from Kepler and Tess is that most of the exoplanets that we're discovering are nothing like the planets in our own, own solar system. Generally, exoplanets can be sort of split into three groups. Uh, the first is the hot Jupiters. So these are planets, uh, as the name implies, around the size of Jupiter, sometimes a little bit smaller. Uh, however, unlike Jupiter, which takes 12 years to you know, make one orbit around the sun, uh, these planets orbit their stars in a matter of days. And so that's why we call them hot Jupiters. Uh, they're so close to the star that they are being baked to nearly 3,600 degrees. We obviously have no analog to this in our own solar system. But uh, hot Jupiters are actually comparatively rare with all the other exoplanets that we find. Uh, the other two groups make up the majority of planets we find today. Uh, these are the so-called super-Earths. Uh, the first one is the so-called super-Earths. So these planets have uh, radii around one to two times the size of the Earth, and uh, we generally think that they are mostly rocky planets with very little, if any, atmosphere at all. Uh, the other population is the sub-Neptune population with radii a little bit bigger, two to four times the size of the Earth, and uh, we actually find that these planets are much less dense than the super Earths. So that leads us to sort of imagine that these sub-Neptunes have a very rocky inner core, but because of the uh, lower density, they could actually be enveloped by a very sizable atmosphere, sometimes taking up around 10% uh, of the total mass. And if you know anything about Earth's atmosphere, that is orders of magnitude more atmosphere than we currently have. So just a little quick disclaimer. Um, when I say things like super-Earths, I really don't mean that they are like Earth. Uh, they most certainly are not. Uh, that's sort of the unfortunate thing about pop science articles, is that they always claim to have found Earth 2.0. Um, that's pretty much why, but they need to get reads, so I understand it. Uh, the vast majority of planets found around uh, other stars, especially by Kepler and Tess, are extremely short period and are on extremely short period orbits and have very high temperatures. So if we take TOI 561, for example, this is a uh, super Earth around twice the size of, of our own Earth that uh, was discovered just last year. Um, this, a year on this planet lasts just 11 hours, and so that actually brings its surface temperature up to 2,000 degrees. So I wouldn't exactly classify that as Earth 2.0. But even though these planets are nothing like Earth, that doesn't mean that they aren't fascinating in and of itself. Uh, in fact, they actually make us question how planets even form in the first place. Uh, before the early 90s, um, most models of planet formation were made in order to uh, explain our own solar system, because that was the only example that we had. And admittedly, it's a pretty ex attractive example. Uh, we have the terrestrial planets on the inside, so Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and then on the outer edges of the solar system you have the gaseous giants, and sort of a hierarchy of planetary formation. But when we look out into the cosmos, we see that that's really not the norm. Uh, the dominant outcome of planet formation, at least for short period planets, are the super-Earths and sub -Neptunes. Now, by grouping these planets together like that, it sort of seems to imply that we know a lot about these planets, but in reality, we're really only beginning to get to know these other worlds. In most cases, uh, we just know how big the planet is without knowing the mass. In some other cases, we know how big the planet is along with the mass, and using, using those two measurements, you can get the density, and with the density, you can sort of uh, make some approximations as to what these planets might be made out of. But um, in, in order to, I mean, I say might, because there are many different planet compositions that can also have the exact same uh, mass and size. So you could have sort of a rock, a 50-50 rock-water mix, and, or something that's mostly rock, and they can actually give you then the error bar is the same mass and radius. So we call this sort of a degeneracy of planetary composition. Just knowing those two values, you can't really figure out which one it is. But in the uh, best case scenarios that we have right now, uh, not only do we have a mass and size to high precision, uh, we're able to use very powerful observatories like the Hubble Space Telescope to peer deep into their upper atmosphere of these planets. And what we found is that exoplanets actually show a lot of diversity. 
Uh, although we're at sort of the limits of our technology with this kind of stuff, uh, the atmospheres of, say, the sub-Neptune population uh, show some, pop some planets where they seem to actually have a very high cloud deck. So these are all showing just different atmospheric spectra taken by um, my advisor and his um, collaborator, Laura Kredler, back in 2017. And uh, we can see at the bottom here, it looks pretty flat. And that's indicating um, that these planets might actually have really high altitude clouds that are blocking out any of the features. But as we kind of go up on this graph, you can see it kind of gets a little more, a little bumpier. And a lot of that has to do with the resolution that we have. But we can see that there are some spectral features. So that means there might actually not be clouds in these atmospheres. So even planets that have sort of similar masses and radii, like the sub-Neptune population, they can show completely different atmospheric properties. And the newly launched James Webb Space Telescope will certainly revolutionize our understanding of these planets by peering deeper into the atmosphere of especially small planets uh, in unprecedented detail. But looking into a planet's atmosphere only gets us so far. Uh, the composition of a planet's atmosphere is nothing like the composition of the actual planet itself. You know, sort of think about it. We breathe oxygen, not granite or sandstone. So as powerful as JWST will be, uh, in order to, it won't be able to do a whole lot for us in figuring out what the planet is really made out of. So how can we address this? How can we begin to find out what's inside these planets without you know, taking a shovel and actually going there? Uh, well, it turns out that in order to know thy planet, you must first know thy star. And as far as we know, in order to form planets, you need to first form a star to host them. So stars form from giant clouds of interstellar uh, gas and dust that collapse under the power of gravity to form a star. Uh, but not all that material in the initial gas cloud goes into the final star product. Uh, so as the cloud collapses down, much like an ice skater bringing their arms in to rotate faster, so too does the cloud rotate faster, and that quick rotation actually compresses the cloud in sort of like a pancake shape with a young star at the center. So sort of exemplified right here. And um, this, is this disk that contains all this material that hasn't gone into the young star is called the protoplanetary disk. And it is sort of the staging ground for all the future planet formation. And uh, it will create the planets that will eventually orbit that young star. And this isn't hypothetical or theoretical. Uh, even though the Earth was born four and a half billion years ago, we still right now see active planet formation going on in our galaxy. So this is an actual image of a young star uh, forming with a protoplanetary disk surrounding it. And uh, although we cannot see the planets directly, we can imply their existence from the fact that there are these sort of ring-like voids going through the planetary disk. And that is where astronomers believe that material is being gathered up into the formation of planets. And this is just the like, prettiest example that I could find. We find these everywhere. So why is this so important? Uh, it's because although the protoplanetary disk eventually disappears, uh, leaving only the planets behind, uh, the chemical imprint of this disk is left on the star itself. So we know this because in our own solar system, the remnants of the building blocks of planets are still around. Uh, meteorites that fall to Earth are an incredible window on the early solar system, and uh, we can analyze the chemical composition of these fossils of planet formation, and what we find is that the elemental abundances in these meteorites match surprisingly well to the elemental abundances that we see in the actual sun. So by looking at the chemical makeup of stars that host planets, we can actually get a good idea of what kind of material was available to form those planets in the first place. There's already a hint of this uh, when we first started studying exoplanets. Uh, so, just a little bit of jargon here. When astronomers study stars, they usually describe the stars using a few different parameters. Uh, of course, we have mass radius, but we're also interested in temperature, surface gravity, how fast the star rotates, but also this thing called uh, metallicity. So, to astronomers, uh, and we really kind of piss off chemists with this, but anything that is not hydrogen or helium on the periodic table, uh, we just call it metal. Um, carbon, it's a metal. Oxygen, yeah, it's a metal. Um, it's not very accurate, but when 99% of the universe is hydrogen or helium, uh, what you call the other 1% doesn't really matter. So, 
the metallicity of the star is just a way of measuring how much stuff is in that star that isn't hydrogen and helium. And what exoplanet scientists found early on is that we see more giant Jupiter-sized planets orbiting stars that have a higher metallicity, or they have more stuff that isn't hydrogen and helium. So going back to the protoplanetary disk, uh, we remember that the chemical makeup of that disk is reflected in the star. So if stars have a higher metallicity, uh, that probably meant that the protoplanetary disks had more of the material needed to build giant planets. Sort of in hindsight, this makes sense. More raw material means that you can build bigger planets and more of them. But this metallicity value, uh, this is sort of just... Average isn't quite the right word, but you can think of it like that. It doesn't tell you specifically how much of each element is in the star, like oxygen, carbon, or magnesium. Which is sort of unfortunate, because what we would like to do is know if stars with differing amounts of these different elements create different types of planets. And for the vast majority of stars, we only know this sort of bulk metallicity value, not the individual abundances of different and the main reason is it's actually a really hard thing to measure. Uh, it takes a lot of time, uh, it takes a lot of grad students, and it's very uh, computationally expensive, so a lot of people just don't do it. So that sort of brings me to my work. Uh, it's what I like to call the Keck Abundance Project. And uh, it uses a very powerful tool to sort of circumvent the difficulty of determining the amount of each individual element in stars, uh, machine learning. So machine learning in and of itself is incredibly complicated, uh, but just to put it sort of simply, uh, we use a database of stars where we know beforehand how much of each individual element is in there using sort of traditional methods. And then we feed that database into the machine learning algorithm, and uh, it actually learns how the differing amounts of elements change with the way the data looks. And what that produces is, I put it simply here, a model, and we can take that model and apply it to data where we don't actually know the value. And from that knowledge, from the known data, it will actually give us an estimate on what the elemental value of, the, of that star is. And uh, a collaborator of mine has done exactly this, using high quality data from the, some of the largest telescopes in the world, uh, the Keck telescopes in Hawaii, uh, and we called it Keckspin. And uh, what I'm trying to do is take Kexpec and figure out the elemental abundances for as many stars as I can. So the beauty of Kexpec is that even though it does take sort of a long time to get it to learn about this data, once it's actually learned, it's able to apply that knowledge incredibly quickly. I'm able to determine the abundances for a star in a matter of seconds, when, whereas it would have taken you know, at least a week amount of work to look at the spectrum and actually figure out those individual elemental abundances. And so as of now, we're looking at being able to measure the abundances of 15 different elements for nearly 4,000 different stars. That is a huge amount of information. And not only is Kexpec efficient in that it's able to do this quickly, it actually is surprisingly accurate for what a lot of people kind of think is black magic, and I don't blame them, machine learning is kind of screwy. But it works. Uh, so what can we do with all of this? Well, three of those elements are iron, magnesium, and silicon. And what makes these elements important is that they are crucial building blocks of rocky planets, like Earth. So the inner core of the Earth is primarily made of iron. Uh, the crust that we're standing on is nearly a third silicon. And then the mantle below us, it has an appreciable amount of magnesium. So you can sort of ask the question, if there is a different amount of, say, magnesium or silicon available when the Earth is forming, would we still see the same sort of internal structure of the Earth? Sort of like baking a cake. If you have a different amount of baking powder or flour, uh, I'm sure a master baker can tell you you're missing some ingredients. So being able to know how much of each of these elements were available when planets are forming can probably help us get an idea of what the structure of these planets might be like without actually going there. So along with iron, magnesium, and silicon, we're also looking at the elements that make up the air that we breathe. So oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. These elements are particularly interesting to exoplanet scientists because they might be able to tell us where in the protoplanetary disk planets formed. 
And uh, the reason why we say that is because if you were to look at, say, the ratio of carbon to oxygen or nitrogen to oxygen, uh, as you go out from the star in the protoplanetary disk, the temperature decreases, and this ratio can actually change. And so if you have a planet forming at a certain point in that protoplanetary disk, it could inherit that particular ratio of C to O or N to O that could be observable at JWST. Uh, another thing is that the amount of elements that are available in the disk can dictate what kind of sort of uh, carbon-bearing or nitrogen-bearing species can uh, actually exist within the atmosphere. So the amount of carbon to oxygen can affect whether or not the atmosphere creates CO2 or uh, CO, which is carbon monoxide. And so these measurements could prove very useful when JWST finally starts investigating these worlds. And finally, uh, we go back to our own solar system. So, as we know, the planets that we see are pretty atypical. Uh, why do we not have a super-Earth or sub-Neptune? Why do we have eight planets, whereas most systems that we observe have just a single exoplanet? Well, perhaps the part of the answer lies in the elements that were available to form the solar system in the first place. By obtaining chemical profiles for a number of stars that are sun-like, we might be able to find that the star that we know and love is actually chemically unique. <coughs> And so through this work, I plan to compare our sun to about 500 what we call solar analogs, and hopefully uh, place our sun in a little more context. And so I only mentioned about six elements that I'll look at, but in reality, there are, we'll get values for 15. Uh, multiply that by 4,000 stars, and you have an awful lot of information and a pretty large data set. And it's not likely that I'll be able to discover all the sort of nuances in that data set for that reason, I'll be releasing all this information as a catalog to the wider scientific community, so that way exoplanet enthusiasts can also use it. But uh, not only them, uh, stellar astronomers who are interested in seeing how the chemical profiles of stars are distributed around in our galaxy should also be able to use this catalog as well. So hopefully my work will uh, be useful to other astronomers for uh, years to come. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank the Astronomy Associates of Lawrence uh, for the invitation, but I'd also like to take just a few moments to recognize that the data that I use in my research comes from one of the many telescopes on top of the mountain of Mauna Kea, and uh, it is a mountain that holds a very large cultural significance to the Native Hawaiians, and uh, I, am a, among some of the, I am among a growing number of astronomers who are starting to view the opportunity to make observations from this mountain as a privilege and not an entitlement. Thank you. Uh, um, the composition of the uh, pre-solar cloud um, have anything to do with, uh, I guess they call them like different generations of stars because some of those heavier elements, you know, formed in earlier stars that have since died, and so, is that yeah, a... Yeah, exactly. So, um, the question was, uh, do uh, younger stars have an influence on the stars and the protoplanetary disks that come after them? Yeah, exactly. So, as a star goes supernova, it can uh, sort of distribute its elements throughout the, throughout its part of the galaxy. And part of the end stages of stellar evolution is you start forming heavier and heavier elements. So as a star explodes and sort of seeds these elements to the galaxy, um, you do get sort of a multiplying effect because more stars will eventually form from those, uh, we call them polluted clouds that have a lot more, that have a higher metallicity. And so, yeah, the, there, there should be sort of like an age component to it. But as long as you're sort of just like looking at relative star to protoplanetary distance, they start from the same amount of stuff, or the same stuff hypothetically. Uh, it shouldn't matter too much. But uh, also, stellar ages are really hard to do, unfortunately. Have you seen any, um, in any of the data of the exoplanets, have you seen any of the migration that they think might have taken place in our solar system? Yeah, yeah, exactly. In some of those other solar systems? So, if we go back to, where am I at here? Yeah, uh, hot Jupiters. Hot Jupiters cannot form, as far as we know, where they are now. Um, hot Jupiters are sort of indicative of a 
period of migration that our solar system didn't seem to go through. And uh, so these planets had to have formed way out in the edges of their system where they can collect enough, not only rock, but also ice, because they need that extra amount of material to have such a huge gravity well to get all this extra sort of light elements like hydrogen and helium. And so uh, there, are, there have been a few studies where they have been able to measure, say, the C to O ratio in these, um, in these exoplanets and said, yeah, they had to have migrated from further with it, uh, further out in the protoplanetary disk at some point in the flight. So you're saying that analyzing the chemical composition of the star allows you to make inferences about what the planets might be like? Yeah, exactly, because um, since... Because? <laughs> yeah, so... My, my point being, would knowing the composition of our sun allow us to allow us to predict our planets, which are so extremely dissimilar within the solar system. Yeah, so, yeah, looking at the, um, looking at the amount of elements in our own sun, it does, to a certain extent, match the elemental abundances that we see in our own planets. Um, obviously, there's some planetary evolution, so it's not sort of one-to-one, -one, um, but sort of within the air of ours, yeah, um, the planets that we see in our own solar system, abundances within them and the structure that we see uh, matches what we would assume uh, you would get from a star in our own Even though Jupiter is made almost entirely of hydrogen and helium and, yeah, and, so and for, the Earth is mostly iron, I mean, this seems so different. Yeah, so for, yeah, exactly. So for those two types of planets, uh, the rocky planets and the gaseous planets, especially for the gaseous planets, um, things like uh, iron and magnesium and silicon probably won't help you too much, but Knowing the amount of oxygen and carbon in the volatile elements can actually be pretty, pretty uh, helpful as well. Yeah? Um, you describe three, di three different types of planets, mm -hmm. categories of exoplanets that you mostly find. Do you, or exoplanet species in general, suspect that there may be any other for lack of a better word, classes of exoplanets that we can't detect because of the limitations of our current technology. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that is a real good question. It kind of gets to two points. One, humans love classifying things. Um, surely when we actually get better data about these planets, we're going to see that these two groups are probably going to have subgroups. Um, it's not as cut and dry as, oh, this is sub-Neptune, super hot Jupiter. Aside from the hot Jupiters, they're pretty easy to classify. Um, yeah, so the naming convention is not completely set in stone. It's going to be fluid. Um, some people even refer to things called sub-Saturns. And at that point, I think you're sort of cutting too much into it in the data that we have. But yeah, our sensitivity also has a very, very um, profound effect. Uh, with the, I can't remember where it is. Yeah, this showing uh, the amount of planets versus metallicity. Uh, this is for periods of one to ten days, so very short period planets. And the fact of the matter is, we're very, we're not very sensitive to long period planets, especially with things like the transit method. Because in my field, if you want to claim that you discovered the planet, you need at least three transits. And so, if you know if you're trying to discover Jupiter, which has a orbital period of twelve years, you're waiting twenty-four years, which is pretty much how long people have been looking at these things. So. Uh, we're, there are other detection methods that are sensitive to long period orbits, uh, but then there's, you can't really get small planets out of that. So there's a bunch of different biases that are kind of going into, observational biases that are going into this. Does this continue to be the most important way of detecting exoplanets? But I know there are others. Yeah, so uh, this chart, yeah, so uh, there's a little more here. I blocked it just so it's not very messy. Uh, but the red is radio velocity, which is one of the first methods to detect an exoplanet. It's not the most efficient. The green is the transits. So once we had the transit method, just things went gangbusters and we found tons of planets. But then you also see uh, purple and blue. Oh, yeah. yeah, so blue is direct imaging, so actually be able to see a planet next to a star. Um, it's really hard to find those because there's no good wholesale way to find those types of planets. Like the transit method, you can just stare at a patch of the sky and be like, oh, that did 
but with direct imaging, you have to expose for a very long time using very expensive uh, instruments in order to actually find them, and so there's only been a handful of direct imaging. So the overwhelming amount of data is from the transit. Oh, yeah, overwhelming, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yep. You mentioned that the James Webb Telescope is obviously well, it's going to have an impact um, just because of the nature of it. It won't have as much of an impact on exoplanet searches as it might because of the way it's built. If you were going to make a telescope that would massively impact exoplanet searches, what would it need? Oh, that's a really good question. That's a super good question. Um, yeah, James Webb isn't going to do much in its terms of discovery just because, one, it's oversubscribed. Not only is it doing exoplanet science, it's also doing what the galaxy people want to do, it's doing what the Big Bang people want to do, and it only has a lifespan of around 11 years. Um, I think right now the only really good way of discovering more exoplanets is the transit method. So Kepler, which is now unfortunately dead, but they did an extended mission before it died, and TESS, which is now they think that it's going to go for another five to seven years. So that's really our best bet. Because these radio velocity planets, uh, the reason why they took so long to get any of them is because you have to look at individual stars and actually see the signal grow over time, which is very expensive, and when telescope time is very well needed, you can't devote full surveys to radio velocity. Most of the ones uh, discovered now are sort of following up planets that are found by TESS. That's actually another thing that I do. Um, so yeah, radio velocity, there's, they sort of like interchange between each other. But yeah, transits, it's the best we're going to get for a very long time. Any other questions? What, what's the estimate of the transit planets that have been discovered versus, you know, maybe systems where we're looking down from the top and there's never going to be a transit, but there may be planets yeah, the, otherwise? People, yeah, people do work out the probability. I mean, you can imagine uh, if we go, like, if that's the geometry, you sort of have some wiggle room. Like, maybe it's a little more tilted. It's still going to transit. just kind of depends on what the projection in your sort of 2D sky space is. But, I mean, I would, it's definitely less than like 20%. I don't know the actual number by heart, though. But when people sort of look and say, okay, this is the data that we have. We know we have these observational biases. How can we account for them? Um, people who do that kind of stuff you know, know what their selection function is. Yeah, it's pretty low. <laughs> How is that field that you chosen? Uh, this field, oh, sorry, no, that field, yeah. yeah. So that was that was before I was in the field. <laughs> this was like back in like 2007. Uh, I think they just chose a patch of sky that had sort of a high star count, but not too crowded of a field. Like you don't mm -hmm. want to look exactly onto the plane of the Milky Way, yeah. just because you these pixels are only so big, and so you'll get a lot of sort of contamination from other stars, and it'll be hard to discern okay, well, which star actually has the planet? And so, but you can't look completely on the opposite way of the disk because then you don't have any right. stars. Right. There's probably some optimization problem that they figured out. But uh, TESS, on the other hand, it's not shown here, it looks at the entire sky. Um, they just did a whole side sky survey, and, um, whereas K2 only did maybe 5 to 10% of the sky, uh, TESS is doing the entire But it's also sensitive to different types of planets, so it, it gets a little complicated. It's fascinating. Any other questions? Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Let's go look at stars, I guess, right? <laughs>